Hello and welcome to WePC Benchmarks. Today we are optimizing Microsoft Flight Simulator. We'll be looking at how to get the most out of your game, as it is known for its poor performance. But even so, the game itself is nice and enjoyable to fly around interesting areas, or ones you know, or even just the activities of trying to perfect landings are a great joy. The gameplay does not require the highest of frame rates, as can be seen by the fact that the game tries to limit you to just 60 FPS, but it is still nice to have the most for a smooth experience. Even with the new update bringing great optimizations, we still go through all the settings and see what each of them does and choose the best ones for gameplay. So, please subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for the best options for the game. Today we'll be flying low, down the River Thames starting from runway 27 at London City Airport. This is not a usual flying, but could be if you're just here to look at the view and appreciate the surroundings the most. We will be conducting our tests with all options on Ultra, then individually changing one option at a time to see the effects of the individual ones. So, let's get started. We head to the options menu, where all the good stuff is. We are running the game at 1440p in full screen mode and with VSync off. Then we head to the nice long list of advanced settings, where the majority of optimization will occur. We'll start from the top and compare all available choices for the options. We start off with anti-aliasing. This is the option where the edges in the image are smoothed out to help with realism and help with transition between different parts. There's four options to choose from. TAA, Temporal Anti-Aliasing. DLAA, Directionally Localized Anti-Aliasing. FXAA, Fast Approximate Anti-Aliasing and Off. But what are the differences between these? Well, TAA is a technique combining past and current frames rendered to remove the jagged edges in the current frame. So for each pixel shown, the past frame is blended with the current one to create an anti-aliased image. This method is very taxing as it requires the most computing and storing of past frame to combine. The next option is DLAA. This method detects borders and patterns in the image and blends the pixels in these to produce the image so it is less demanding than TAA as it only requires the one frame and only works on parts of the image at a time. Then there is FXAA. It is meant to be the fast and performance based rather than quality focused. So it is an algorithm created by Nvidia that passes over the image looking at light levels and disregards things too dark like in shadows. Then it compares contrast edges to know which parts to blend and does so and blends them perpendicular to their direction. The method is fastest, short of turning anti-aliasing completely off. Surprisingly in our testing there wasn't much difference in frames between these options and the average stayed around 25 or 26 with everything else on Ultra. But it can be effective. So for the best we'll go for FXAA, as it still may have an effect for other systems, as our processor is much stronger than most. The next option is for the terrain level of detail. This option adjusts the visual quality of the terrain and how much data is loaded for it. The game gives us a slider to use between 10 and 200. So comparing 200, 100 and 10, we can see the quality of the buildings, roads and water decreasing with the lower settings. The average FPS goes from 26 to 27 and then 31. And this makes sense as between 200 and 100 there is not much visual difference so the biggest effect was below 100. So we want to choose an option below that but we don't want the minimal so we'll go for around 60 just to keep some visual quality but also gain advantage of those frames. The next option is for terrain vector data. This affects the quality of terrain vector data tessellation. What does this mean in simple terms? Well it is how smooth the surface of objects is rendered. Vectors are the 2D images of the objects in the game and the tessellation is how much mesh is introduced onto that vector. This mesh is then used to calculate how much surface area and curvature of the surfaces there should be and are used to create the 3D image. So it's like having a cube adding a lot of mesh onto its surfaces and these are used to curve the surface of the mesh and this starts turning a cube into a sphere. In flight sim it says it affects oceans, lakes, rivers and roads and we have five options for this setting ultra high medium low and off comparing them there are no visible differences and they don't produce much difference in frame rate so we'll just knock back this setting to high as in testing this still gave us good fps and higher lows for a smoother experience then we have the building setting this adjusts how well the buildings look. Visually, they do get a bit worse for quality, but not as much as expected. Yet the FPS can increase up to around 3 FPS between ultra and low. So we'll knock it down to medium, and that should give us around 2 FPS more. The next option is for trees. This affects the visual quality of trees. There is more significant change between ultra and low, and low is much more blocky, and there is a difference of 2 FPS between them. And so we'll select medium, as the trees still look recognisable and give a good increase in performance. We also have the option for grass and bushes, which affects the visual quality of them. This one was less noticeable, but there wasn't much around. 
so we'll also put that on medium. Our next slider is for objects level of detail. This is for all the other kinds of objects, it's not mentioned in the previous settings. There's much less of these, so it's hard to spot them or see much of a performance increase, but we'll drop it down to 100 for a good balance. Now we have a very significant option, volumetric clouds. This affects the visual quality of the clouds and how good they look. We found this to have a huge effect on the frame rate especially when being tested in cloudy weather conditions. The clouds lose depth and become more cartoony as we progress from ultra to low, and you can see on the screen. But you can also see the big performance increase from this setting. Each setting gives us roughly two FPS on average, going from 26 with ultra to 32 with low. So we'll set it to medium, as that still leaves some depth to the clouds and nets us around four FPS on average. Texture resolution is the quality of the textures loaded which can be important for a quality look in the game. But we will just stick to medium textures for a good balance of look and frame rate. It also increases our lows. Next, we have anisotropic filtering. It's a setting to enhance the image quality of the textures on surfaces in the image that are at an oblique angle from the camera. This also eliminates the aliasing effects, working alongside anti-aliasing to remove the blur and preserving detail at more viewing angles. This can have some visual effects, but not too very significant. So we'll lower it to two times, as it will help with the lows we get. The next setting is texture super sampling, which is adjusting the quality of key materials in the game. This is an anti-aliasing method for key components such as the floor markings. So with lower settings, this will mean lower quality. However, in our testing, we did not notice much difference between the settings. So we'll go with the two by two option, as that does give some performance increase and stability in frame rate. Moving on, we have texture synthesis. This affects the quality of them. But what are they? Well, they are the large digital images created from smaller digital sample images that use their structural information. So this means if you have a library of different textures, like a pattern of bricks or a weave or a pattern of rocks, that can then be applied to any image you want. So then if you have, say, some writing, the process will apply that texture to the background of that writing and apply it to the writing as well if you want. I assume in Flight Sim, this is used for making terrain in non-mapped areas of varying generic structures. In our testing, we did not find many differences in visuals and not much of a performance change, but we'll put it to medium for a good balance. Next up, we have water waves, which affects the resolution level of the wave simulation. So when you're flying higher, there's not much change between the options. So unless you're using more seaplanes and flying low, then the best setting is low, as it does improve the frame rate stability. Then we have shadow map. This is the process of mapping where shadows should be, what shape and size they should be. They do this by rendering the scene from the light's perspective and everything is lit that gets here and everything else is in the shadow. The depth of these is stored and then the scene is drawn from the camera's perspective and the shadow map is applied to it. So this affects the resolution of the shadows and therefore how good they look, the depth of them and how they resemble what they are the shadow of. This isn't a strictly as necessary feature and shadows can be pretty demanding. So we'll put it down to 768. Our next setting is terrain shadows. This will affect the quality of the shadows produced by the terrain and is similar to the mapping option. And we'll set this to 256. The next option is for contact shadows. These are the shadows closest to the objects and may lack the definition set by the standard mapping. So special calculations are done for these. It's not a necessary part of the visual experience, so we can turn that op option off. Our next choice is for windshield options. This affects how precipitation and reflections look on the windshield and higher options will look better but will affect the performance more. So we'll set this to low for a good increase, as personally I tend to fly it in the outer cam, so it doesn't really change much for me. From inside the cockpit, it may be different for you. Ambient occlusion is next, and is again an option affecting the shadows. It is a shading and rendering technique to find how dark an area should be. Each surface point gets an accessibility value, which is used with either the ambient sky or a surface if it's inside. This results in a diffusion in the shadows, rather than something being in shadow or not. So it does look a bit more realistic with a gradient. We'll drop this setting down to low. The next option is reflections. This changes the quality of reflections wherever they are. You mainly see the effects of lowering the settings in the river below and objects being reflected in it. You can see the details start to fade between them until they disappear entirely and only the clouds remain. The air effect on FPS is not that significant, but every little helps. So we will put this option down to low. Light shafts are next, and are the column of lights from sources of light, mainly from the sun. It's hard to tell visually how the settings affect the quality, but they do offer 1 or 2 FPS on average, so I'd turn these down to low. The last few options are mostly down to personal preference, but we'll go through them each anyway. Bloom is a replication of Im imaging effect of real-world cameras, where lighting extends from borders of bright areas in an image. This gives the illusion of a very bright area that is overwhelming to the camera or eye. 
I turn these off as I don't enjoy many cinematic effects. Next is Depth of Field, which does have some effect on performance, but I'd still turn it off. Depth of Field is the distance between the nearest and farthest objects that are acceptably sharp in focus, and so a lot of things can become out of focus and blurry if you have that. Next up is Motion Blur, which I always turn off, as it just adds awful smearing effects when turning. Lens correction will be turned off, as from what I could find, that will make things sharper in the cockpit for you. Lens throw is another camera effect that creates halo effects from light sources, and I also turn these off for some improvement. The class cockpit refresh rate is the refresh rate of the displays inside the cockpit, and so higher rates affect performance negatively. And so if you use those, you may want to increase them, but we don't, so we put these on low. Another important setting is the weather. There's a 4 FPS average difference to be found between the weather options provided. Unsurprisingly, the clear skies option is the most performative option, as there's nothing for the game to render in the sky, and gives us a 29 FPS average. Compared to broken clouds, rain or storms, that only give us around 24 or 25 frames. In our testing, we used scattered clouds and that gave us around 26 FPS. Obviously, the best option would be clear skies, so that option is best if you want to extract the most performance out of your game. But if you want something to look at out there, then few clouds, high level clouds are also a good option. So there we have it, those are the best options for playing Microsoft Flight Simulator. The new update has helped a lot with the performance of the game already, but hopefully now you can enjoy it even more. Even when an option seems to only give us a 1 or 2 FPS increase, that does equal to a 2-5% to 5 increase in FPS so it can accumulate significantly in the game. And as you can see, in this comparison, our custom settings gain us about double over the Ultra preset. Here we have around 53 FPS on average, compared to the 26 we got. We do see some popping of buildings and terrain, so if that does annoy you, you may want to play around them a bit more. So, I hope you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you in the next one.